it's time to talk about violence. No, I don't mean the good, clean, and fun kind of violence we've explored in films like Ichi the Killer, with that rapscallion of a protagonist, Kagihara. No, I mean the more direct, unadulterated violence. The more unfun kind. Films like Ichi or Kill Bill. They're fun, don't get us wrong, and we love them for what they are, but their violence, despite how repulsive their special effects can be, is cartoonish when you get right down to it. They operate in their own contexts, their own universes, which are predicated on a system of rules where the kinds of violence they contain can happen with little to no consequences. We're talking today about examining a more realistic take on violence, more specifically the after effects of what happens to those who survive it. That's why today we'll be taking a look at Shinji Aoyama's perhaps best known film, Eureka. Born July 13, 1964, Shinji Aoyama has been noted as an eclectic director to say the least. While studying at Rikyo University in Toshima, Tokyo, he entered the film industry, where he worked with several directors inside and outside Japan, an experience which helped him to develop his style. In the tradition of us accidentally picking films directed by people somehow related to those we've already covered on the show, Aoyama began as an assistant director to Kiyoshi Kurosawa whose Sweet Home, Pulse, and Cure we've discussed in the past. According to Aoyama, he was deeply moved by Kurosawa's 1985 film Do Re Mi Fa Girl, and working with Kurosawa had a major impact on his career. He debuted his first solo film in 1995 with It's Not My Textbook, before skyrocketing to larger success with his first theatrical release in 1996, Helpless, a gangster revenge film starring our old friend Taranobu Asano, who you'll remember played Kakihara, the lead in Ichi the Killer. Aoyama stated in an interview that he often has multiple projects conceived at a single time, pulling inspiration from real-world news resources as well as personal experience. He went on to say that what ultimately determines which of his films gets made is the budget being offered by a production studio. For Eureka, it has been said that the inspiration was the Tokyo subway gas attacks perpetrated by Aum Shin Rikyo in 1995. Which, for anyone who has pre-knowledge of these attacks, you can already imagine how bleak of a film Eureka is. But before we delve into the background on these attacks, those of you who are familiar with the attacks, please don't misunderstand. Aoyama has stated that he likes humorous or quote-unquote stupid things. His words, not ours. He says that when he sets out to make a film, he wants it to be somewhat comedic, but that the product never ends up that way. For Eureka, he explained, his producer asked for a more serious film, and he simply told the producer that he wanted to make a three-hour black-and-white film, at which point the project was immediately greenlit, without any further questions over the film's content. Aoyama, like Seijun Suzuki, whom we covered several episodes back, doesn't storyboard any of his films. He says that he thinks intentionally about how a scene might look and how he wants it, but that the actors and crew don't visit shooting locations for extended periods prior to photography, and that the particular way in which things are shot comes about more so on the spot. Cinematography for Eureka was done by Masaki Tamara, who began his career as a cinematographer for respected documentary filmmaker Shinsuke Ogawa. With Ogawa, he filmed the Narita series, which detailed the lives of farmers displaced for the construction of an airport in Chiba Prefecture, and the student protesters who sought to stop this displacement. Later, Tamara began to work with a number of other directors, among them Toshia Fujita, the director of the Lady Snowblood films, which Tamara filmed. He also shot fictional films for Mitsuo Yanagimachi, who is perhaps best known for his debut documentary about biker gangs in 1970s Japan, Godspeed You Black Emperor, as well as Juzo Itami and Kiyoshi Kurosawa, names you might, again, recognize from our Sweet Home episode among others. Beginning with the 1996's Helpless, Tamara has worked on a number of Shinji Aoyama's projects, lending Aoyama his visual style and eye for beautiful scenery and framing, while complementing Aoyama's improvisational attitude. Once the mammoth three and one half hour project that is Eureka was complete, it was toured a lengthy festival circuit between 2000 and 2001, including an appearance at the 2000 Kane Film Festival where it won both the Fipresci Prize and the prize of Ecumenical Jury. 
It officially opened in Japanese theaters on January 20th, 2001, and has since received physical releases in Japan and the UK, the later being under the label Artificial Eye, making finding a subtitled version fairly easy for English speakers. That being said, if you haven't seen the film, we recommend more than usual seeing it before you approach this video. We're going to be summarizing the movie to help with the discussion about its themes later on, but some of the plot points might not have the same impact if you know that they're coming, given how the film is paced and structured. Eureka opens with a bus ride through a spacious town. Two children, Naoki and Kozuo Tamura, are waved off by their mother as they board the bus, and it drives on, and on, and on. The bus is eventually boarded by a squirrely man, and we immediately cut to a parking lot. The man has hijacked the bus and killed almost all of the passengers. He says he wants some fresh air, so he takes the driver outside with him as a hostage, where the police promptly shoot the man. However, it isn't a fatal gunshot, and he downs an officer before climbing back on the bus and killing another hostage. By the time the cops subdue the man, only the two children from before and the driver are left alive. Here, we see the heartbreaking realness that awaits us in Koji Yakusho's performance as Makoto Sawai. Time passes and we observe how none of the survivors of this bus jacking have made it out unscathed. In short, they're all traumatized. The children have been left alone to fend for themselves, while Makoto has taken up a new job and become heavily dependent upon his family. However, he is thrown out when a rash of killings spreads across their sleepy community, and his family fears that Makoto may be involved, or at least that he may be accused as such. Makoto reconnects with the children, and the trio form a bond through their mutual trauma. They gut and refurnish a bus, which they then take on a lengthy trip across the country. In the process, Naoki and Tamura are allowed to come to terms with their lost innocence and childhood's end, while Makoto begins to rebuild his life anew. Admittedly, this summary makes the film probably seem rather short, and while you could condense this number of plot points into a two-hour film, we believe Eureka is an important lesson in why pacing is so important in cinematic storytelling. Aoyama likened the length of the picture in an interview to experimenting with dance choreography, saying that it's only through trial and error that one will find what works best in terms of pacing. Thus, through his lack of planning exactly the shots or actions on camera, and improvising the action while the dialogue has been practiced exactingly, Aoyama's films maintain what one might call a different time signature compared to more mainstream projects. In Eureka, Masaki Tamura and Shinji Aoyama use a multitude of extremely long takes, sometimes lasting several minutes and covering a pretty broad spatial range. This helps to suck the viewer into the experience, and really helps you to get into the minds of the characters. The three and a half hour runtime might seem daunting at first, but it's the type of film that honestly doesn't overstay its welcome, and that allows you to really absorb these extended and beautiful shots. The length and pacing seem very deliberate, even if we know they were only partially premeditated. And if you're going to make a film about a subject as bleak and drawn out as long-term depression and PTSD, it might benefit the project to be bleak and drawn out, which is exactly how you might describe Eureka. Bleak, drawn out, yet somehow hopeful. On that note, I think it's about time we discussed the inspiration and implications of the film a little more. First, let's look at the main inspiration for the film, which will require a bit of background. Aum Shinrikyo, which borrows its name from the Sanskrit utterance of Aum and the Japanese term for teaching of truth, is a New Age religious cult, which was originally led by Shoko Asahara. Asahara was a partially blind practitioner of acupuncture, a traditional career path for the blind in Japan. He founded Aum in 1984, under the pretense of having the answers to a generation's fears concerning the new millennium. Whenever a nation gets to a certain point of wealth and power, its populace can be observed to begin seeking existential answers, creating a vacuum in which these types of new religious movements can fill the void in these people's lives. A number of these new religions began to crop up amidst the wealth and opulence of the 1980s in Japan, with Aum being one of the larger groups. Aum Shinrikyo was only one of many of these new religious cults, but they were particularly successful from an early point at gathering followers. For his answers to life's questions, Asahara borrowed from the writings of Nostradamus, the Book of Revelation, Hinduism, and Buddhism. 
blending these elements to create an idiosyncratic set of teachings, and as the cult grew in age and membership, doomsday predictions. Shoko Asahara taught that the United States was going to instigate the Third World War and bring about the end times foretold in Revelation in the year 1997, though he eventually moved this date up to 1995 with Alm intended to provide members a means of escaping the fallout from this dark future. Alm Shin Yikyo garnered its fair share of controversy from an early age due to its fanatical beliefs and its habit of advertising publicly for membership. Before 1995, Alm was secretive about its darker elements to the point that, to a non-member, the organization offered the promise of happiness, intelligence, and improved health. This was helped by the force of personality that was Shoko Asahara. He became something of a darling to the public eye, using his charisma and swagger to win over numerous TV hosts, among them Takeshi Kitano and their audiences. Though when running for political office, this darling status didn't translate into support on the part of Japanese citizens not enlisted in Aum. With new members, rumors have long circulated that they were subjected to initiation rituals involving illicit drugs and psychological reconditioning, retribution against members who had fled the group and either been captured or returned of their own accord is said to have been even worse. With these individuals being subjected to days-long hallucinogenic-fueled nightmares as punishment. It was discovered in the early 1990s that the group had murdered a member who tried to leave in 1989, along with anti-cult lawyer Tsutsumi Sakamoto and his family, in the same year, though this was not made entirely clear publicly until later in the decade. Throughout the first part of the 90s, Aum perpetrated several public attacks to test the efficacy of biological weapons that they had begun to synthesize most notably sarin, a nerve gas which can cause death within 10 minutes following the administration of an extremely small dose, and which will notoriously cling to one's clothing after exposure. Again, these attacks were not completely nor publicly linked to Alm until later. After these early public tests, Alm Shinrikyo committed the first act that they're most well remembered for, which was the 1995 Tokyo subway sarin attacks in which five separate subway cars were targeted for the simultaneous release of sarin during the morning rush hour of Monday, March 20th, 1995. These attacks ultimately killed 13 civilians, injured 54, and affected 980, though Asahara had envisioned the attacks as killing thousands. This incident and its fallout are detailed through interviews in Haruki Murakami's book Underground, The Tokyo Gas Attack and the Japanese Psyche, in which the world-renowned novelist interviewed dozens of survivors of the attacks, and family members thereof, as well as former and then-current Aum members. Following the attack, Asahara and other major players in Aum, along with a number of minor members, were arrested and jailed. The remainder of the group then proceeded to splinter into two new groups, Aleph, initially a rebranding of Alm's main sect, and later Hikari no Wa, or Circle of Light, a new group which splintered from Aleph later on. Tatsuya Mori, with his 1998 and 2001 films A and A2, followed the cult during its initial rebranding to Aleph and the lives of cultists in the latter part of the 1990s following the attacks and during their fallout. But for the purposes of examining Eureka, we're not so much interested in what happened on the part of the cult, as though the film was inspired by the Tokyo subway attacks, the cult element has been entirely removed from the narrative. But don't think that all this knowledge of Alm was totally unneeded, this will make sense in a bit. With Eureka though, we're more directly interested in the aftermath of such an attack from the perspective of the survivors both those who were there for the attacks and the Japanese public as a whole. It's hard to imagine the impact of something so volatile as the 1995 Tokyo subway attacks if you're not a part of the culture or time in which they erupted. Being an outsider looking in probably feels rather similar to being an American born in the late 90s or early 2000s, with no cognizance of the differences in our country before and after the events of September 11, 2001. Even more difficult to understand is when the attacks seem entirely to go against the doctrine of the people committing them, 
This is where all the background of Om comes in. They were and are a group who outwardly express a want for peace and love, and who were regarded as little more than eccentric New Age hippies who could never harm a soul. Sure, people didn't want Asahara in public office, if election results have anything to say about it, but most people regarded him as something of a teddy bear, not a despot. Going one step further, how could citizens of a country perpetrate such heinous crimes against those claiming the same home? Prior to Aum, there had not been such a large domestic terrorist attack, save perhaps the East Asian anti-Japanese armed front's bombing that killed eight, which we explored in our episode on Battle Royale. Something on the scale of the Tokyo subway attacks simply had not been seen up to this point in Japan, and it arrived amidst a decade of economic strife and disenfranchisement, with a system that had supported post-war Japan for an entire generation before faltering. All of this might seem like superfluous detail, but we really just want you to understand as best someone who can, who wasn't exposed to these things directly. It's easy with the perfect vision of hindsight and the knowledge of Alm's shady deeds now brought to light to simply say that they were lunatics from the get-go. But at the time, it was absolutely mind-boggling, to the point that before hard evidence and testimony linking them to the attacks began to emerge, the public was in disbelief that Alm could have done this. For your average citizen of Tokyo, not only did these attacks rock their entire life, but it was incomprehensible to consider that Alm had perpetrated them. What made things even more difficult to understand was the motivation behind the attacks. There are ideas as to Aum's intentions, like religious radicalism or brainwashing. But even here, it is known that at least one of the perpetrators of the attacks faltered at the last minute before committing to it. There are no definitive answers, which left Japan reeling in the wake of the attack to question what the attacks meant to each person individually and to the nation as a whole. Underground examines this, just as A and A2 do this in their own ways. And Eureka does this in yet another way. Eureka introduces a man who is given no explicit motivation who commits a horrendous crime. You can guess at his meaning. Given how he talks to the police, did he want fame? Was he a disgruntled salaryman given his dress? Was he simply psychotic or sociopathic, as we are prone to thinking of killers who don't have clear motivations? The film provides absolutely no answers for this, but doesn't focus on this man or his origin, as A and A2 and the second half of Underground do with the Alm cultists. What results is not a definitive answer to why tragedy happens, but a theory, one interpretation, as to what happens after tragedy. Because Eureka follows the survivors of an Alm-like senseless attack, we explore the lives of Naoki, Akihiko, and Makoto all in depth. And all of these explorations are hauntingly similar to the accounts described in Haruki Murakami's Underground. These three characters, as you'll see later, very closely mirror the experiences of survivors interviewed in this book. They all admit to having moments following their respective traumas, when they have wanted to harm others, but they have all developed different coping mechanisms. These moments that they describe, where they wish to harm another, are a product of intrusive thoughts, which are a phenomenon that almost all human beings experience from time to time throughout their lives regardless of whether one has a history of trauma or not. Ideas will enter into your mind, perhaps of a violent or sexual nature, which can be distressing due to being unconscious and unwanted. The idea of hurting someone you know and love, or of having sex with someone who you know is inappropriate to think about in that way. Virtually all humans have these thoughts, we just don't talk about them because they're unpleasant to feel and to discuss. But they increase in prevalence in individuals who experience other psychiatric issues. Most commonly, sufferers of obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, and body dysmorphic disorder report experiencing intrusive thoughts on an increased scale. Also susceptible are those who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, which our three main characters could perhaps be exhibiting symptoms of. This is similar, as you may have guessed, to actual survivors of the Alm attack. As you can see for yourself by checking out Underground, numerous survivors experienced PTSD in one form or another, just as each character in Eureka does. Akihiko, as we see with his response to Naoki being taken into custody, and his comments on never returning home, is the type to move on when the going gets tough. 
Makoto tells him early on that he is mature for his age, but later on one might wonder if this maturity is thanks to his ability to cope with situations. In other words, to shut up his emotions and pretend to not have any. Or is it merely an illusion due to his ability to ignore his emotions until they aren't a problem anymore? Perhaps this is why Makoto ejects him from the bus, not because he wants to save Naoki's name for Akihiko's slander, but because he wants to force Akihiko to confront his issues head on and to finally learn and grow. This is a commonality in how society at large treats trauma survivors, with Akihiko being the perfect embodiment of both the ideal survivor in society's eye, someone who packs it in and moves on, but also the embodiment of why this doesn't work as Akihiko, by all appearances, is a calm and collected young man, but actually still bears the weight of his trauma and has simply ignored his pain rather than dealing with it. Makoto, on the other hand, tells us that he suppressed the urge to harm others, rather than ignoring it like Akihiko. This helps us to learn that, while he might seem like a weak character at points due to his insistence on taking care of himself earlier on, and then taking care of the children, more or less ignoring his problems as with Akihiko, he is actually a very strong character who has actively strove to mute a part of himself that the trauma inflicted on him. Like Kozo Ishino, a 29-year-old man interviewed in Underground, Makoto can't fathom why the attack they endured happened, but he knows that he must go on one way or another. As Ishino said in the book, quote, why was all I could think. Even with the IRA, I could at least see things from their side and maybe begin to understand what they had hoped to achieve. But this gas attack was simply beyond all comprehension. I'm just lucky to get off with minor symptoms and no after effects, though that's no consolation to those who lost their lives or still suffer from it." End quote. Makoto in the same way seems to count himself relatively lucky and commit himself to bettering his life and those he takes care of. Naoki, meanwhile, has taken to violence as a means of coping. He has begun to act on the intrusive thoughts in order to satiate them, because it is relatively easy for him to kill without considering the consequences in the moment. He may be depressed and repulsed later on by his actions, as we see in the restaurant scene, but for him, the thoughts are too powerful to ignore given his lacking a developed set of coping tools. He is a teenager who never got a proper adolescence, his youth being stolen when he was forced to be a part of the bus jacking, and further when his parents left. As is noted in Underground concerning the attacks which inspired Eureka, quote, Many of them remarked on how intensely they hated those Alm thugs, yet they found themselves deprived of any outlet for their intense hatred. Where could they go? Where to turn? Their confusion was compounded by the fact that no one could pinpoint the sources of the violence. End quote. Thus, Naoki lashes out at what he sees as easy targets, since he has no means of striking directly at those who have hurt him. All the while, Kozue withdraws. We never learn whether she has intrusive thoughts or not, though she seems more depressed and suicidal than Naoki, given her actions throughout the film, when she rushes to the cliff in the last scene after effectively saying goodbye to everyone she ever knew, when Akihiko discovers her upstairs having hurt herself, and when she lays in bed after Naoki leaves, still refusing to speak except to Makoto in their own made-up language. Kozue is, in this way, the most difficult character to read, but she also provides a totally different lesson on trauma survival. Kozue, and more importantly how she interacts with her world, her brother, and her new friend, shows us their language and how it has changed due to their shared trauma. The idea of a language of survivors is explored throughout the film. Early on, we learn that the children more or less don't speak. Instead, gesturing when they need to communicate something. The trauma of the bus jacking robbed them of their voices, and so they must learn to speak again. This happens through meeting Makoto, who is the first person to try and understand them on their terms, rather than forcing them to speak the common language. He understands their plight, and they have an unspoken agreement for taking care of and supporting one another. Contrast this with Akihiko, who comments he thought they were just hungry when they ordered for four, not understanding that Makoto was already living with them. He doesn't ever try to understand them on their terms. Instead, he usually guesses at what they mean, or speaks instead to Makoto, who can translate for him. This type of lingual distortion comes into play sometimes in the case of PTSD, where victims will find themselves having been muted by their trauma and the after-effects thereof. We see at one point Makoto in a jail cell after being arrested, where he begins to speak through tapping to someone in the next cell. 
This image is repeated when the three cannot sleep in the bus during their trip. It evokes the idea that they are prisoners of their trauma, but it also speaks volumes about the language that we as humans develop to understand one another on a deeper level than what our proper native tongues might allow. Note also that Akihiko sleeps through the tapping conversation, again choosing the path of ignorance. Each of the three has a particular timbre to their knocking, their own voice while Akihiko abstains from conversing, blissfully unaware that the other survivors are speaking of their feelings and their plight. This goes back to the lingual distortions we mentioned earlier, where Makoto and the children are learning to speak a new language. In Underground, multiple survivors and family members speak candidly about how they didn't discuss the Tokyo subway attacks with anyone prior to their interviews for the book or how family members of their own were strongly opposed to their appearing in the book. Eureka, through this second non-verbal language, shows us how survivors of trauma not only have to learn to speak again, but also displays the societal pressure for them to get over and move on from the incidents they lived through, further muting them. But as much as Eureka is a film about how people, trauma survivors and non-survivors alike, learn to communicate, and how to continue once our lives have been interrupted, it's also a film about how we transform and sometimes cannot communicate. During an early scene with the female co-worker of Akihiko, she delivers to him a letter stating that he must come in for a doctor's visit soon. Persistently, he puts this off, until we see in the bus trip portion of the film that his coughing is becoming downright deadly. By the conclusion of the film, he's barely able to walk, and when Kozue is casting out her shells, we see that Makoto's handkerchief is soaked in blood. He looks at her, perhaps to ensure that she hasn't noticed, before telling her that it's time to go home. This could be meant to indicate that while caring for the children has helped him mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, he has ultimately let his own health fall by the wayside. That perhaps because he doesn't deem himself worthy due to his survivor's guilt, or because he simply doesn't want to be thought of as selfish by even one more person, he is more interested in helping the others than in helping himself, even at the detriment of his own health. Despite the journey that we have taken with these characters, we see their transformations, and can recognize that their journeys are not complete. Makoto is ill, Naoki has become a murderer who is in jail, Akihiko has begun to grow up in a way that makes him distant and untrusting of others, and Kozue has begun to learn to speak again, but only to say goodbye. We might not have known the characters before their traumas, but Eureka makes it clear that they have been forever changed, and that they still must learn to live with themselves and with one another. Maybe we're just overly susceptible to these kinds of things, in an age where it seems like we're expected to be more desensitized to violence due to the dispersal of information being more widespread than ever before. But truth be told, over the years of working on this series, this has been one of the hardest videos that we've ever made. It's not the minimal yet gritty violence at the beginning of the film that affected and disturbed us so deeply, however. Reading up on Elm Shinrikyo was fairly troubling in its own right, but more so it's the implications and the aftershocks of the violence that affected us. And coming back to that three years later, and remembering that was something that has simply been pushed out of my brain for a while, was not exactly the most pleasant thing either. Reading about the disasters of 2011 for the Shin Godzilla shorty was tough, but this was a whole other beast, given the nature of these attacks as premeditated and intentional. The horrors experienced by our main characters here, and the people who survived the Tokyo subway attacks, are something those of us who haven't survived tragedy can't really understand, as far as I can tell. We're incapable of empathizing, truly, but I think this is exactly why Eureka is a monumentally important film, because it doesn't try to make us empathize with these characters for their survival. Instead, it asks us to sympathize with them, even if we aren't like them, for their struggles to survive after the trauma, and it helps us empathize with them simply as human beings by providing a number of different responses to tragedy presented throughout the four main characters. Ultimately, Eureka does what any film about tragedy should aim to do to elicit this sympathy and or empathy. It focuses on the humans behind the tragedy, the human element rather than the ramifications for society as a whole. In the real world, we usually discard these people as soon as their stories are no longer newsworthy, which is precisely why films like Eureka are extremely important. Or on that note, the works of Tatsuya Mori, who to this day is still publishing information about Aum, including two more books after A2 was finished filming. And this level of empathy and sympathy is why we say that we can summarize the film and discuss its meaning, but ultimately it's something you have to view and experience for yourself to fully appreciate.
We think what we're trying to say is best summed up by Shinji Aoyama himself, when he said, quote, I guess a movie is life. But, well, it's really hard to define, but a movie is something more than life. It captures something you can't really put in words." End quote. 